Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's This Week in Global Health. Um, I'm Chris Ronson, and you are joining us today for an episode on non-communicable diseases uh, and the WHO status report. Now, we're a pretty small panel today. Greg can't make it, nor could Brian Simpson and a number of our other panelists. So we're going to be covering everything from start to finish. Um, again, I'm Chris Ronson. I'm coming to you from San Francisco, California. And I'm going to hand it over to Jessica and Jordan, who's joining us uh, as a return panelist from the Young Professionals Chronic Disease Network. Jessica, where are you coming to us from? And tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm Jessica Taff, and I'm coming to you from the Washington, D.C. metro area. And uh, I just want to say happy Ash Wednesday to everybody that is celebrating the Lenten season. Um, I'm currently hungry, um, which is <laughs> fitting because this season's all about fasting and, uh, you know, good behavior, which is perfect for what we're going to talk about since we're going to be talking about NCDs. And you all know that, um, you know, there's a lot of bad behaviors that go into the contribution of the global burden of disease due to NCDs. Excellent point. And Jordan, tell us where you're coming to us from, a little bit about yourself, and also a little bit about YPCDN. Yeah, great. So my name is Jordan Jarvis. I am speaking to you today from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, so I'm the executive director of the Young Professionals Chronic Disease Network, which is a global community that seeks to mobilize um, emerging leaders from all over the world to take action against the growing burden of non-communicable diseases, and particularly um, the burden of NCDs uh, um, that is driven by social injustice. Uh, and so for myself, I'm also based here in Boston as a fellow at the Harvard Global Equity Initiative. Well, we are thrilled to have you here this week. Thank you so much for joining us again. If Thanks you are familiar with our past episodes, Jordan was actually on one of our Access to Medicines episodes speaking about access to NCD medications as well as a number of other things. Uh, now, since we are without Brian Simpson from John Hawk, well, for now, we're going to do a little bit of news delivery really quick, give you two top stories as well as one related to today's topic. Um, we've got two that are sort of on the topic of vaccines. So the first one is the pertussis problem. Uh, the Politico news site investigates vaccines' role in the return of pertussis, or also known as whooping cough, in the U.S. It infected 100,000 people in the U.S. since 2012, and vaccine refusals do not appear to be the problem with this uh, increased transmission and sort of emergence of it. Now, the vaccine was reformulated to avoid side effects, including high fevers and seizures in babies, in the late 1990s. After these new vaccines were rolled out, pertussis cases began climbing, even as vaccination rates remained constant. So check that article out if you want a little more background information on what's been going on with that situation. Um, also, on a very somber note, officials in Pakistan confirmed that four members of a polio immunization team were murdered after being kidnapped in one of Pakistan's provinces. Um, I have a province name, but I'm afraid I'm going to butcher it. So, <laughs> um, And additionally, in an attack on a polio vaccination team Saturday in Pakistan's Khyber tribal region, gunmen killed a driver and wounded a healthcare worker. Um, attacks on immunization teams in that region and everywhere else globally have now claimed 71 lives since December 2012. So we here at This Week in Global Health stand with the organizations and the families who have lost loved ones who have been making a real contribution to the cause against polio. I'm actually going to turn it over to Jordan for our NCD story. Jordan? Thanks, Chris. So WHO released a news story last month that, in line with the WHO's Global Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of NCDs, uh, which is for 2013 to 2020, India is the first country to develop specific national targets and indicators aimed at reducing the number of global premature deaths uh, by N from NCDs by 25% by the year 2025. Um, every year, roughly 5.8 million Indians die from heart and lung disease, stroke, cancer, and diabetes. In other words, one in four Indians risk dying from an NCD before they reach the age of 70. And that's a very important, actually, before we move on, I'm just going to preface this with, much as Greg had huge internet problems during one of our episodes, I am having some major issues as well, so apologies for any technical difficulties. Also, if you're watching us live at twig.org or on the YouTube site, thank you for joining us. If you're watching us in the future, thank you for finding us, um, and please feel free to tweet at us before, during, or after the show at Twig Team on Twitter or emailing us at hello at twig.org. Um, now, the story that Jordan just shared, those statistics really go a long way in um, 
in illustrating the impact that NCDs are having in uh, developing countries everywhere, and developed countries as a matter of fact, um, NCDs, also known as chronic diseases, kill 38 million people per year, which, and almost three quarters of NCD-related deaths occur in low and middle income countries. Now that death toll is projected to increase to 52 million people by 2030, and the report, uh, the WHO report points out that in the 15 year time span between 2011 and 2025, cumulative economic losses due to NCDs, and this is if we don't take action, so sort of a projection, uh, if we don't take action and start doing preventative uh, efforts and treatment, uh, that the cost in low and middle income countries is estimated to be seven trillion US dollars. Wow, wow, Chris. That's um, a really staggering number when you consider that the WHO estimates that the cost of reducing the global NCD burden is one or sorry, eleven point two billion US dollars a year, which means that it would only take an investment of one to three dollars per person to reduce this, the, the global burden that we've been seeing. Mm -hmm. And that's a really impressive uh, fact to know because I think a lot of people assume that it costs a ton of money. You look at how much healthcare costs in general mm -hmm. and it seems like it would take almost an immeasurable amount of, of money to resolve the issue. And uh, that's sort of why we're focusing on the WHO progress report today and how they're trying to address this issue with both their action plans and the status reports. Right. Thanks, Kristen. So the 2014 status report that the WHO released in January um, aims to further define and support the implementation of the, the uh, targets that were set um, through the Global Action Plan uh, by providing information and advice on how to scale up and implement programs. Providing uh, They provide baseline data and updated estimates of NCD mortality and risk factor information and also there's uh, some case studies sprinkled throughout the document which are really uh, great to see uh, specific examples from different countries on what the progress has been. Uh, the WHO has also released a list of recommendations for best buys um, several years ago and these are for the most cost-effective interventions particularly in low resource settings that can be undertaken. Some of these for example include HPV vaccination for cervical cancer um, and, and so others include banning of tobacco or marketing of unhealthy foods. So now I'm just going to take it back a little bit so we can give everybody um, sort of a context to this WHO, both the action plan and the status report. Uh, Jessica, did you want to give us a little bit of background on sort of how this whole thing came to be? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that we're going to give our viewers that, that background because it's important to understand how this came about. So. In an effort to tackle this huge global problem, the NCD burden, the WHO first published its global NCD status report in 2011. And since then, we have made significant gains to, um, with regard to international cooperation and advocacy uh, regarding NCDs globally. And in 2013, the World Health Assembly approved the NCD Global Action Plan, otherwise GAP-GAP, and it developed these aims of reducing the number of premature deaths from NCDs by one quarter by 2025, otherwise known as the 25 by 25 plan. Excellent. Now, along what Jordan was just saying with the Best Buy or cost-effective interventions, those go back to the nine points that the WHO is trying to address are the major NCDs and risk factors. Um, with their most recent plan that they rolled out, or I'm sorry, with the progress reports, uh, the plan that they've given us provides a global monitoring framework with nine voluntary global targets addressing key NCD risk factors, and those include tobacco use, salt intake, physical inactivity, high blood pressure, and harmful or detrimental use and consumption of alcohol. So each chapter in that action plan outlined one of the specific aforementioned issues and goals, uh, the monitoring framework and progress uh, towards those goals, identification of potential barriers towards attaining the targets, as well as any progress achieved and future actions required. And then that brings us back to exactly what Jordan was saying. Jordan, did you sort of want to expound on that a little bit more? Sure. I think, uh, so in 2011 there was a high-level meeting at the UN on non-communicable diseases, which is the second ever meeting on a health issue. The first was on HIV AIDS. And countries made commitments uh, uh, during that meeting and again in this past July in New York at the UN for a follow-up meeting uh, to, to, uh, to reach the targets that were set by the WHO, the mm -hmm. ones that you just mentioned. And, and 
in 2011, NCDs weren't viewed so much as a development issue as they are now. They're one of the major health and development challenges of the 21st century, and also a social justice concern in terms of both the human suffering they cause and the harm they inflict on the socioeconomic fabric of countries, particularly in low- and middle-income countries. And so it's really encouraging to see NCDs viewed as more of a development challenge and uh, they're also in the discussions in the sustainable development goals that are up coming up this year. Yeah, and it's important to note that as of December 2013, only 43 countries had operational, multi-sectoral, national plans consistent with what the WHO had put forward in the Global NCD Action Plan. Um, as I briefly mentioned, there are the nine key points that the WHO is trying to address. Um, instead of focusing on each of those individual points, because again, these risk factors and the non-communicable diseases themselves are very important and very in-depth, we're actually going to talk today a little bit more about the implementation of it. Now, the WHO recommendations are that each country have a multi-sectoral plan, so sort of transdisciplinary, um, with nation-specific targets, and that's part of a necessary framework for addressing NCDs and their risk factors very effectively. Now, all sectors obviously need to work together, as with any situation, uh, towards both prevention and control of NCDs, and using national targets that are consistent with the global targets they've outlined is a huge priority in being efficient and being effective. Okay, well, um, well, Jessica checks on that headset. I'll go ahead and everyone's welcome for that long silence. Go ahead and go over what she was just talking about, and that was the many factors that go into developing the targets we were just talking about. That includes considerations about what can realistically be achieved by each nation, and that is taking in uh, financial and epidemiological factors. It's also very important to look at the feasibility of implementing evidence-based, well, hopefully, interventions, um, developing baselines for monitoring, and uh, checking out and really taking into consideration the current level of services and potential rate of scale-up. All right, right I'm back, guys. Sorry. <laughs> that was totally my bad, and I'm the one with the technical difficulties. Thank you, Chris, for continuing on the conversation. Those were great points, and um, yeah, that's very important for everyone to understand. It's much better than I did, but we missed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and to carry on from those points, I mean, it's, uh, it's also important to consider that the action plans are like, more likely to be implemented if they're inclusive and developed in collaboration with a full range of partners across dif different sectors outside of the health sector. Um, so, for example, when the he Ministry of Health is looking at their plans and implementing programs, they want to be working with Ministries of Health, Ministries of Trade, um, and others, agriculture, um, outside of health to make sure that they understand um, the impact that their policies also have on NCD prevention and control. Uh, and aside from uh, the intergovernmental interaction, it's also important to consider interaction with the private sector. Um, there are important roles to be played by the private sector, but there are also a lot of concerns within the global community and within specific countries about conflicts of interest posed by interactions with the private sector. So, mm -hmm. for example, in, in, with food industry, uh, beverage industry, um, pharmaceutical industry. And so there's actually a the so-called global coordination mechanism for NCDs uh, that is the, the body that is designed to, to help meet, uh, set into action the action plan and meet those targets that we've talked about. Uh, and they are tackling issues like looking at interaction with the private sector and mobilizing resources for NCDs. And so there's a working group actually discuss meeting this week in Geneva to talk about the interaction with the private sector and how to safeguard public health. Yeah. And we're definitely going to talk about that a little bit in the discussion portion of what we're doing today because it's a very interesting paper and it goes into more detail about how to actually integrate all of the different aspects of the health system as well as the private sector. Um, into coordinating to really have an effective, um, to have effective results generally. Now, a couple of other important points in having the non-communicable disease action plan is that uh, it's really the success of it is contingent on strong governance and leadership in both coordinating and implementing the plans. Now, obviously, state and uh, governmental and even private sector leaders really need to focus on prevention efforts to reduce the risk of exposure to risk factors. And we can do this through supportive environments, 
um, you know, like workplace or workplace health, uh, promotion of health behavior and healthy eatings, um, health education, so really putting the power back in people's hands as far as taking control of their risk factors and preventative efforts, as well as ensuring affordability, so making sure that people have access to preventative care. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan, actually, for a really important point on that. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, this all needs to be considered in the context of uh, strengthening health systems. So uh, moving away from a lot of the global health efforts that have been fairly vertical, as we say, in the past based on specific diseases to have cross-cutting and diagonal approaches to health um, and, and to health development. And also the move toward universal health coverage uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that people aren't plunged further into poverty through out-of-pocket spending for healthcare costs, um, while also working to improve the efficiency of primary care and increase domestic investment in health and health financing mechanisms. And so that primary care aspect is, is particularly important. I've seen that personally in the context of Kenya, where there's a lot of um, uh, there's so many there are so many great opportunities to integrate better NCD care by strengthening primary health care. Yeah. And now that we have Jessica back with sound, do you have anything you'd like to add? <laughs> I do, I do. Let me also just point out that it's important that this, this NCD action plan has a way of developing and institutionalized ways to measure progress and accountability um, towards these goals. Now, the ways that they can do this, they can do it through implementing civil registration, disease registries, uh, also mobilizing information and communication technologies that serve the health of the population. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I think one of the biggest issues we've had have been monitoring with people not realizing what an impact NCDs were already having on the population. Um, we sort of didn't uh, create that baseline. People weren't able to quantify just how much suffering was happening because no one was paying attention to it. So having those disease registries and again the civil registration of life and birth um, are very important. Because people always say what gets measured gets done, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so we're actually pretty much at time for today. So let me just take the opportunity to thank everybody for uh, tuning in. If you're watching us live, I hope you're sticking around for the after show. We're going to go a little bit more into the public sector aspect of it, as well as discussing some of the WHO's key messages. We're going to focus on two of the seven that have to do with uh, poverty alleviation, as well as how some countries still do need to make process. Uh, Dr. Greg Martin will be back with us next week, uh, and we hope that you will join us for our episode where we interview Hans Rosling. So again, hello at twig.org, email us, text us, or don't text us, uh, find us on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not giving my phone number publicly like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we will see you guys all next week, and have a good day.